The South Carolina Hall of Fame was founded in Myrtle Beach in 1973 to recognize and honor contemporary and past citizens who have made outstanding contributions to South Carolina's heritage, history, and progress. Benjamin Elijah Mays was born the youngest of eight children in the community of Epworth in Greenwood County on August 1, 1894. A son of former slaves, May's childhood played a key role in shaping the monumental figure that he would become. They were a very religious family, especially the mother, and um, uh, she would call them into her bedroom each night and pray for all the children. And May says that she would pray especially for me because I was a baby. He's born at what's called the nadir of race relations, the worst period in American history when all the rights that have been gained during Reconstruction and the Civil War are taken away from African Americans, rigid segregation is set in, and he is born during that period. He fights segregation from day one. He begins uh, to do that um, even as a child. The atmosphere of hate, lynching, violence, and forced segregation made a lasting impression on Mays. His childhood became the defining period in his life. It was then that he realized he wanted something better. Mays developed an insatiable desire to get an education. Uh, so Dr. Mays went to the small brick house school. His teachers immediately noticed him. They would say things like, Benny is very bright, reinforcing just how smart he was. Uh, and he wanted to go to school. His father, like many, many fathers, white and black at that time, saw education as a waste for a farmer. Why do this? And he had to some royal battles with his father over going to school. After pleading with his father to allow him to go to school, Mays left Epworth to attend high school at SC State College in Orangeburg, South Carolina. After graduating class valedictorian, he attended college in Virginia. He left there after a year to compete with Northern Whites and enrolled at Bates College in Lewiston, Maine. His uh, desire to learn and to get an education was also, I think, uh, driven by the fact that he didn't believe that there was any group, um, whites in particular, that were superior. The Bates experience was a positive one for Mays. Here, he developed his first white friends and was treated with respect. Shortly after graduating from Bates, he married Ellen Harvin and accepted a position at Morehouse College in Atlanta to teach higher math in 1920. His wife died in 1923 following an operation in an Atlanta hospital. In 1925, Mays taught English at SC State College and met his second wife there, Sadie Mays. From 1934 to 1940, Mays served as Dean of Religion at Howard University in Washington, D.C. In 1935, Mays completed his work and earned a Doctor of Philosophy in Religion from the University of Chicago. He saw education as a pathway to fulfill his own destiny, but also to fulfill the destiny of an entire nation. Hero Morehouse, Hero Morehouse, we have pledged our lives to thee. It was as president of Morehouse College that Mays achieved his widest scope of influence in civil rights and education. Mays became president of Morehouse in 1940. Those years from 1940 to 1967 were the critical years for Morehouse College, emerging on the front end from the Great Depression. And over the course of those 27 years, really becoming a national asset. In 1944, because of the early admissions program established by Mays, Martin Luther King was admitted to the college at age 15 as were other gifted high school 11th graders. Dr. Mays uh, would always speak, almost always, uh, uh, to, the class, to, the, to the student body in Sale Hall Chapel on Tuesday. And legend has it that uh, when Dr. Mays was scheduled to speak, no student cut chapel. He was so inspiring, illuminating. One of the keys to his life was the proverbial challenge to students to do better, to aspire to higher possibilities, to have great ideals. 
trying to live up to your capacity, to live down below your capacity, is the cardinal sin. Students knew that they would walk away from his messages uh, ennobled, empowered, soaring. And he told stories, and he challenged them with his high aspirations. He affectionately became known as Buck Benny because of his fundraising efforts to get students through school. He worked quietly under the radar, so to speak to advance the cause of education at Morehouse College. He made a tremendous impact. This was at a time when the Depression, and it only cost $81 to keep a college student in school. And he wrote everybody he could think of to ask them would they send one student to college. It wasn't known until after his death that Dr. Mays had been corresponding with Margaret Mitchell, author of Gone with the Wind. They developed a relationship where she not only educated one or two students, but she finally came to a realization that there were very few black doctors when her maid became ill. And so she came to Dr. Mays and said that any young men that you think could qualify to be physicians. I'll be glad to pay their tuition if you don't tell anybody. Perhaps the most significant relationship that he developed was with Martin Luther King Jr. Mays became both a spiritual and emotional mentor to King. And Dr. King admitted that he was led to the ministry because of the influence of Dr. Mays especially during his famous Tuesday morning chapel sermons to the students. And because he didn't have any boys, he always looked at Martin Luther King as a kind of a son. And Martin Luther King looked at him as a spiritual father. In 1936, Mays discussed nonviolence with Mahatma Gandhi during a world tour of the YMCA. He brought those teachings into his sermons. I would believe that this influenced Uncle Benny and his messages to the students here, which I can just imagine young Martin Luther King Jr. sitting here in Sale Hall on Tuesday mornings, soaking that up and that forming some of his views about nonviolence. If there hadn't been a Benjamin Mays, there wouldn't have been a Martin Luther King Jr. That he was very much a product of Dr. Mays' religious thinking, he was very much a product of Dr. May's influence from Gandhi that was passed on to him. And he turned to Dr. May's for advice. Longevity has its place, but I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. Indeed. Dr. King's influence in the civil rights movement is permanently imprinted into the fabric of America's history. On April 4, 1968, Martin Luther King Jr. was shot and killed in Memphis, Tennessee. Dr. King had hand-picked Dr. Mays to deliver his eulogy in the event of his death. Mays continued his influence meeting hundreds of national and international leaders. But he's one of the great architects of the civil rights movement, not only in training uh, individuals, but in, in writing in his books as a leadership in churches, as a pastor, and as a college president. He set the standard, and he was uncompromised. He was appointed by President John F. Kennedy to serve on the Commission on Civil Rights, and he played a role in the World Council of Churches uh, on its Commission on Race and Race Relations. So Mays was involved in the global and national level in high-level conversations about the future of our nation, of what kind of America we'd be post-segregation. Uh, During Dr. May's long tenure as president of Morehouse, he traveled and spoke and wrote extensively about the evils of segregation. In 1966, the Braves baseball franchise moved from Milwaukee to Atlanta. Jackie Robinson broke racial barriers more than a decade earlier. But for black players entering in a new city in the Deep South, at the peak of the Civil Rights Movement, this was a whole new ballgame. 
when we first moved here, of course, this was the first time that a, south, a team of Major League caliber had ever moved this far south to play baseball. And of course, he was one of the guys that was uh, one of the persons, really, that made things a lot easier for myself and some, some of the other black ball players. He talked to me about playing baseball. He said, I was here to play baseball. The other things, just let other people handle it, you know, like the civil rights and et cetera, you know, let other people handle it. My job was to play baseball. And believe me, it was a big job. But, you know, it, it was just, it, it, was a, it was the kind of advice that probably to this day I look back and I say, you know, for him to have said that really meant an awful lot to me. Despite hate mail and death threats, Aaron broke Babe Ruth's home run record in 1974 when he hit his 715th home run. Two years after retiring from Morehouse College, Dr. Mays was elected to the Atlanta Board of Education. He was the first African-American board president. Not only did he raise a generation of leaders at Morehouse, but uh, he was responsible for leading Atlanta schools through their desegregation crisis. Atlanta schools were integrated without an incident. In every facet of May's career, he excelled and was held in the highest regard as an educator and community leader. In recognition of his influence in education and racial equality, Mays received more than 65 honors and awards from state, national, and international associations. I think he took Jesus quite literally with this was the purpose of life, to feed the hungry, to clothe the naked, to heal the sick, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. And I don't think you can find a better legacy than that. Dr. Benjamin Elijah Mays died on March 28, 1984, four months short of his 90th birthday. Well, he is one of our, the first citizens of South Carolina and a great representative ambassador and ambassador for American values and American democracy to the world. I don't know who else, presidents, vice president, whoever they may be, that had an impact in, in, in this world as much as Dr. Mays did.